Okay, and we're live. Uh, so, uh, see there's a few people in the channel. Welcome to the first ever um, Birth of a World stream. Uh, so, in this stream, um, I'm going to be talking about the uh, world creation process. Um, starting with absolutely blank slate, I want to start a new world and I don't want to use any of the uh, canned settings that can be purchased or included with games. Uh, if you're in the chat, I can answer your questions if you have any. Uh, we can have a bit of a discussion. But um, yeah, so this is my first time doing this sort of thing. Um, we're going to be kind of feeling it out as we go a bit here, but uh, we'll see what we got going and hopefully uh, get some good out of it. Uh, so you've decided you want to run your own setting. Uh, it can be kind of a daunting thing, right? You, you have to come up with a world is such a big, vast, vague concept. How do you get started? Uh, really, for um, it comes down to this kind of checklist of a few things you need. Really, really, there's three there's three kinds of things you need. Uh, you need obviously your setting, which is to say both a physical location, a mood, if you will. Uh, and kind of artifacts that go around that. Uh, things like uh, buildings, vehicles, st sort of thing, uh, technology, things like that. Um, then you have your actors. These are, in, your, in the case of a tabletop game, your player characters. Uh, your main NPCs and background characters. Uh, and lastly, you need your action, which is to say stuff happening. Uh, primarily, this is uh, conflict between various groups um, or kind of against a hostile world, uh, as well as uh, interaction between people. These three things kind of, you know, setting actors in action are kind of the, the holy trinity of storytelling. Um, every story has these things, no matter how well developed. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about each of them in turn, how to go about constructing them, so that you can relatively quickly turn around and create a world that's actually playable. Uh, the goal kind of I'm going for here is we're going to just get the minimum you need to start uh, playing with your players in sessions, and then we'll start filling in more details. So over here on the right, I've got uh, my world creation checklist, if you will. Um, these are the things you need basically to kind of set up what your world is uh, from a very, very small starting point. Uh, and then as the adventure proceeds, as you actually start playing in this world, you can start expanding out, um, expanding the world, basically creating it just a few step ahead, steps ahead of what your players are creating. Um, as your players explore things, they're going to kind of fill in the details with their own impressions, their own interaction, and you're going to take that and build upon that and make the world into a much bigger, much more vibrant place um, through your play. So I want to start by talking about tech level. I don't have slides here because I intend this to be an unscripted um, broadcast and like I said if anyone wants to ask questions in the chat uh, I will gladly make digressions to answer them. Uh, so tech level first of all, what do I mean by tech level? Well, I mean uh, for instance industrial versus post-industrial. Uh, this example of how many people are farmers in your civilization. Uh, if your setting includes magic, which I'm going to assume it does because most settings have some form of magic, um, be it actually explicitly magic or superpowers or the force, uh, what role does magic play in this world? Um, I think people can hear me. My thing says people can hear me, so I'm hoping people can actually hear me. Um, so role of magic, that's another one that's like, is, is magic technology? 
um, is it common? And really, how much do people interact with magic in their day-to-day -day life? They can hear me, good, okay. Um, I'll also explain that there's a good 20 to 30 second delay uh, on chat between kind of what I'm, uh, when I'm speaking and when I, when you, when you'll hear me. So as a result, uh, questions will have a bit of a delay as like when I get to them. Um, sorry about that. That's a Twitch thing. I can't do anything about it. Um, so what's the role of magic? Is your magic technology? Is it common? Yikes! I need to turn wrapping. Okay. Really, the crux of the role of magic is how much do common folk interact with the magical? Um, it's a, it is a really defining characteristic of a lot of settings. If you think about something like um, Eberron, for instance, uh, they've got, it's a very high magic setting. And so there, magic does serve as technology. You have, you know, the, uh, you have airships powered by elementals. You have a lightning train, you have thing, all these sorts of things. You have massive cities that stretch up into the sky. All of it's kind of held up by magic. Uh, and it's to the point that it suffuses people's daily lives and becomes as mundane to them as driving ca a car is to us. Um, so magic plays a big, big role uh, in, in uh, what a tech level is in settings that include magic. Two other points of technology. Uh, where does power come from if not from magic? So presumably magic is not accept just readily accessible to everyone. I mean, maybe your setting has magic batteries that you can just plug in, but uh, a lot of settings don't, in which case you have other power sources that you have to consider. Um, you're gonna go full steampunk, right? Have everything run on some magic combination of wood, brass, and boiled water. Or you can uh, be using some kind of fuel uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be coal or oil or anything like that. You can make something up, but you have to know kind of what is built into the setting um, so that you can kind of describe things. When people walk through a city, a civilization that uses steam power heavily is going to have a very specific description, uh, kind of descriptive elements that you'll use uh, as opposed to a city that, you know, everything runs on gasoline uh, or coal or fusion power. Um, so that's kind of the other thing you have to think about is where, where do non-magical people um, get their power from? Uh, let's delve into uh, tech, let's delve into some tech level examples. So for instance, a pre-industrial civilization, civilization, yeah, can't speak. Uh, what's some of the tropes common to a pre-industrial civilization? So you would have uh, heavily, uh, heavily agrarian generally, which is to say a large portion of the population are involved in just making sure there's enough food for the rest of the population um, and themselves to survive. Um, this is, you know, feudal Europe. Um, or even you know some uh, tribal societies that still exist in the world today. Um, so uh, it's come common fact. Common facts of life: communication is slow and difficult. Uh, armies are often foot soldiers. Or, ca or mounted cavalry. Um, weapons are, of course, you know, uh, uh, something that's commonly overlooked in kind of a more high fantasy setting is the role of farming implements as weapons. Um, a lot of weapons are really just repurposed farming implements. Um, so, for instance, if you have like a country militia, uh, they're going to be armed with, you know, pitchforks and stakes and pikes and things like that, uh, because that's what you can make if you're a farmer, you can get it quickly. Uh, if you've got hunters, then you have bows and arrows and potentially, uh, you know, short swords, knives, things like that. Um, it, it all kind of 
feeds into coloring the civilization that you're going to start building your, your setting around. You know, what are the people in your setting going to be like? Um, the tech level is a good way to start this because it really also informs look and feel and things like that. So in industrial, this is like uh, so steam power, coal, think colonial Europe. Apologies uh, to anyone who doesn't like my Eurocentric view. It's just the history I know the best. If you want a less Eurocentric view, um, go watch Crash Course or something after I'm done streaming tonight. Um, I should point out that the stream is going to go uh, until probably a bit before 10 um, and then start up again where we left off uh, in a week from now at 9 p.m. again. So every night, uh, every Wednesday night, uh, every week at 9 p.m., I'm planning on doing this stream. So we'll get as far as we get here with our setting up this world and talking about different world types. Uh, and then when we trail off, I'll archive this video and we'll um, reconvene uh, in a week and continue on. So um, let's see. Uh, so an industrial civilization, things like steam power. Here you've got cannon. And, right, and muskets or rifles, um, depending on how much you want to include gunpowder. Uh, gunpowder weapons are a huge balance changer. So if you're taking a setting that's normally sword and board and trying to put in uh, especially accurate firearms like rifles, uh, you will find that it makes it very difficult to balance. And I... Uh, let me see messages in chat. So, uh, question, so Lost Luck asks, do I have a specific idea for this world or will there be some audience collaboration? Uh, and the answer is, I do hope to get a bit of audience collaboration in here. Um, I'll either ask chat uh, what they think of something or um, just listen for people throwing out suggestions. So uh, again, if you have a question or something you want to suggest, feel free to shout it out in chat. Um, and I'll try and repeat it on the stream so that if people watch this recorded later, they know what's being asked. Um, so industrial civilization, you have muskets and rifles and uh, you start seeing infantry that's more organized. So you have things like line of battle. Uh, think red shirts, or red coats rather. So think about men in red coats standing in a line shooting at men in blue coats. Um, that is kind of a lot of wars that took place uh, around this time. And again, you still have cavalry, although now they're, uh, the cavalry is, takes a different form. Um, I guess back in the pre-industrial, we've gotten, you know, as knights are the only ones with, with armor and horses. Whereas now we have cavalry and professional armies. I mean, to some extent, history has always had professional warriors, people who, you know, fighting is their job, is their career, but uh, they get much larger uh, to some extent, at least. Um, I will say that they're more specialized armies. Lastly, in the tech level tree, we get to post-industrial. Um, this is going to be things like, uh, well, modern technology for a large part. And look around you, watch the news, pick up anything. We're not going to talk about post-industrial that much because it, unless you're, I'm not going to be doing a far future based setting. I'm going to be doing a more history style setting. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on post-industrial, but uh, um, we can discuss it if people in the chat want to, but otherwise uh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to uh, talking about how magic fits into a world. Magic's a big topic. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, books spend chapters and chapters on it. Uh, the key, um, it really, the key, the key decision you have to make for your world is how do magic and technology play? Uh, the, 
question. Uh, so how do magic and technology play together, right? Does magic replace technology? Um, because think about it, if you can produce fire from nothing, uh, you don't really need uh, coal, then do you, right? Uh, if everyone has access to abundant magical power, they're probably not going to be resorting to different fuels and things like that. And certain pieces of technology, things like steam engines, might not ever get invented um, just because magic is available. So, um, so that's a decision to make. So let's talk about the world we're actually going to make here. Let's talk about this world because I've been talking about tech now for like 10 minutes. So um, I'm not going to name this world yet, so we're just going to call it Red Potato. So let's talk about the world of Red Potato. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that it's physically Earth-like. Um, that might be boring, you know, uh, if you want to do a floating in the clouds and all that, that's cool, but just a lot of systems work better if there's, you know, very firm ground underneath your feet. And since you're starting into a new world, you want to start with something that's at least a bit familiar. So let's, uh, let's extend this and say... Let's just leave it, the door open for us to make some more weirder um, physical reality to this place. But we'll say that the part we're in right now uh, is going to be physically Earth-like. Um, so for tech level, uh, having talked it out basically in my head and it, to all of you guys, I've decided we're going to actually go for an industrial tech level. Uh, And I'm going to say that we are industrial tech, but magic has replaced uh, much, of the much of the scientific advancement with instead uh, direct access to energy via magic. So um, what's a good example of magic field technology? Uh, Final Fantasy, they do this a lot. Final Fantasies six and seven, especially they had what is it the Esper power, and then they had um, the Mako Mako energy, the planet's lifeblood. We're not going to go. Those are both really sinister. I don't see this going like that sinister. Like both of those, right, was taking something that's alive and basically burning it for fuel. Uh, we're going to go a bit more benevolent here and say. We're going to say that our magic field technology uh, gives you mostly free energy from the ether without, uh, let's keep the moral, co the moral complications down. Um, so what does that mean for us, uh, for our story and our players? Hmm. Let's see. So we have magic field technology. How far in the tech tree do you want to go? Um, let's say cars or no cars. Actually, let's 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 dial it back a little bit here. Um, okay, chat. Locomotives or no locomotives? Let's see what chat has to say to that. Um, while I wait for the stream to catch up, I will say this has rather large implications on the ability of uh, food to move around a region. So the, the accessibility to, for food and as a result, the potential uh, population bases. Lost Luck says trains are cool. Um, so that's one vote for trains. Um, it also makes it much easier for your adventuring characters to get around in the world. Um, 
if you can just hop a train to the next adventure site, um, it saves you potentially a lot of trekking through the wilderness, which I know can be tedious for some groups of players. If you like random encounters, though, um, I'll probably give I'll probably do a session on how to do uh, wilderness encounters at some point. Um, Lost Luck points out that there's always fun train heists as the players get uh, somewhere while doing something plot worthy. That's very true. We, you, trains can trains don't have to be instant travel. You can also you know actually spend some time on the train and have stuff happen on the train if you want to. Um, so I'm going to say yes to trains, um, but I'm going to say no to cars. Um, so, yes to trains. That means transportation and access to food is easier. Um, let's see, what else we got? Uh, uh, magic, having magic as technology means you will probably have fast communication from central powers to remote ones. Uh, basically every mage has a, some ability to send a short message, you know, instantly. Uh, you know, there's usually just a message spell, which is basically Twitter. Um, so we'll say we have that. We have magic Twitter. Um, uh, so we have a magic, we have magic Twitter that will let us uh, send communication easily. So this means also that uh, Viking Viking, your chat is working. Um, at least I saw that message. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll definitely do trains. Um, uh, was I saying? Fast communication also means that armies can mobilize faster. Um, if you ha if you're, the setting is going to have large kingdoms, which it probably will, um, the ability for an army to mobilize and react um, is important. There's the story of the fact that the uh, in the America in War of 1812 the last battle was fought well after the peace treaty was signed because the news traveled slower back in the 1800s uh, and as a result both neither side in this particular region realized uh, they didn't have to fight anymore um, it's a bit of history mm -hmm. so yeah let's say that, uh, Viking Viking makes a good point, actually, which is uh, if locomotives use steam power, it might imply some limitations on magic as a power source. That makes up an excellent idea. Maybe you want magic power to, be, to uh, be heavy or consume a lot of space if, the, if it's powering locomotives. So let's make a note of that. So if magic power is heavy and requires lots of space, then we get trains and maybe zeppelins, but we don't get cars or airplanes um, because you know it's just too bulky. I like that idea, Viking. Thank you for some. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's see what's some other kind of magic powered technology. There's no. So I'm not necessarily using magic as technology. I'm not going to have a gun that shoots lightning necessarily. Um, but I might have a lightning powered uh, machine gun or something like that. Actually, that's another good, that's another one that we want to talk about here. We're doing industrial tech and I totally want to put firearms in. Um, so I'm just going to make a note of that, that we're going to have fire, we are going to have firearms. Uh, and let's even talk, say that they are, uh, we're going to have rifles. So the difference between a musket and a rifle is a huge amount of accuracy, right? A rifle, a musket fires a ball shot that it doesn't fly very far because it doesn't fly very straight. Um, whereas a rifle can fire an actual bullet cartridge, which means it can be accurate at quite high distances. Um, this is going to have a huge impact on how combat works on the ground. Uh, it'll be very interesting to actually play it uh, when we get to that point. So really this is all I want to get right now for the actual for the tech level details. We have a few starting points here. 
we know that we've got an industrial feel to it. So uh, cities are going to be dirty, smoke-choked places. Uh, weapons are going to be more lethal than ever. Um, and uh, armies are going to be able to move faster, get there faster, and food's going to be more readily available, which means cities will be larger and more centralized. It also means we'll have more centralized government, uh, which will become important at some point, probably, uh, in your storyline. So that kind of, that ticks off. Let me save this here. Uh, do, 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 red potato. Okay, so this is red potato so far. Um, so let's move on to the next point, uh, kind of on the world creation checklist. Let's talk a bit about geography. Now I'm not going to start drawing maps just yet, um, mostly because my drawing tablet is broken and I need to get a better one before next week. Uh, but uh, we can still talk about geography and kind of the area around uh, where the adventure is going to start. So let's talk about our starting region. So as we said, it's going to be an Earth-like... It's going to be an Earth-like region. Um, we're going to leave the way open for our world to just take a radical turn to the left when we start talking about the uh, wider geographical scope. But we'll say it's Earth-like. And uh, let's talk about... Okay, that's another question for the chat. Let's talk... Where do we want our adventurers to meet? Are they going to meet in a city? Uh, out a military outpost or a village. And the answer to this will dictate roughly what I think the kind of the biome will be like, you know, if it's a city, then it's going to probably be near a major food source. So it's going to have access to water, it'll have access to farmland, uh, things like that. If it's a military outpost, It'll probably be a more remote region, maybe in the mountains or on the edge of a desert. Uh, food will be more scarce, maybe it's tr uh, brought in by train. Um, uh, if it's a village, it's kind of somewhere in between. Maybe it's a, it's, maybe it's a farming community or a mining community um, there to extract resources from the land. Uh, a small train, so let's see what we got. So get some answers from chat now. Uh, Thekip says, industrial cities are the coolest. Lost Luck votes for a village, a small train way stop in the middle of nowhere. And Harley Silverwolf says a village, start them in a smaller place before taking them to a city on a train. Yep. Uh, good suggestions, good suggestions. Uh, uh, Harley Silverwolf actually brings up a good point, which is that um, a village um, starting in a smaller location means that you, can, uh, you don't have to define as much uh, to start. It's a much, it's a physically small location, but also it's probably a less diverse location. Um, cities tend to attract, you know, various walks of life, um, have various things going on in them. A village can be, you know, a sleepy hamlet or someplace where nothing ever really happens. Um, in which case, uh, the village uh, get, can be a bit better choice. So Thekip, while I do agree industrial cities are cool, um, it seems the majority of chat today uh, are swinging towards village. So we'll set, so we'll have our starting village. Uh, say we have a population of maybe a few hundred, or maybe not even that much. Whatever, it's a low population village, we'll say. And just to break the usual stereotype, we're not thinking like French village in the countryside. This is a mining village. Um, in the mountains. Um, just to kind of, we want to break, we want to break some stereotypes here, uh, just for, well, my own challenge and hopefully to be more interesting to those of you who are listening. Um, so we're going to have a mining village in the mountains. So what's that mean? So that means we've got rugged terrain. 
uh, dependence on trade. In particular, uh, ore out, ore goes out, food comes in. And we probably have a few very wealthy people involved. In particular, the owners of the mine. And a lot of poor people. Now, the, the, the distance between these is relative, right? A very wealthy person from a mining community might be poor by city standards, um, but it's, we just got to kind of keep it in perspective while we're talking about the starting region. Um, is it, Lost Luck asks, but is it a thriving village or on the verge of, dis, of destitution? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so, what are we going to do uh, about that? Let's say, um, well, let's say it's fallen on hard times. This kind of starts leading us into uh, what our first story hook will probably be like. Um, so, what misfortune could befall a, a, a small mining community? Um, you know, maybe the ore is running out. Um, Maybe there has been trouble getting supplies and people are going hungry. Um, we're up in the mountains. So maybe it's been a particularly hard winter uh, and the passes aren't open. Um, is it, you like the, Harley Silverwolf says likes that the mines are dry. Yeah, that's one option. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to look around. I'm starting to look around in this idea. Or uh, Viking suggests a major collapse that kills a lot of people, or that there or Earthquake. This is good. I'm enjoying this brainstorm, even though I know uh, there's a lag going on here. Uh, so let's see. Let's go. Let's go. Some misfortune has befallen the miners. Uh, so let's go with some misfortune has befallen the miners. Um, this is going to lead us in, in nicely to our first story hook. So I'm going to say that this misfortune. Uh, is uh, magical in nature. Viking, I'm seeing you suggest mines are invaded by something nasty. Uh, and Miki says District 12 from the Hunger Games. That's probably not far off the mark. Um, I'm thinking, uh, and many have make the kids work too, maybe. Um, uh, Harley Silverwolf, that's actually a good point, which is that uh, a lot of early industrial, uh, in the early industrial times in things like England, they didn't really have labor laws, so child labor was prevalent, uh, very common in uh, early industrial civilizations, kind of before the dangers of having children working in factories was figured out. Um, so children working in mines, yeah, probably. That's probably a thing that happens, uh, especially the most desperate of families, and maybe since we've had this misfortune on the miners now. Uh, um, so let's talk about what's, go what's going on in the mines. Let's talk about what can be going on in the mines. It's magical in nature. Uh, let's say that. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this is leading, I'm gonna start a new bullet here for a first adventure since it sounds like we're already up to designing that. So we're in the first adventure, we're in the mines below town. In location, we're in the mines below town. Um, let's see, we're going to, um, and our hook is that the mine, uh, Let's say that the mine that has been, uh, let's say that they dug too deep. Let's say they un, uh, set loose something. Um, now when we do this, we're not gonna tell our players what it is, but we obviously would have to know for um, building this. Now, in my case, um, I'm probably going to be running this for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. 
Um, I could just as easily right now take this and run it uh, with Pathfinder or any other setting uh, you might choose. Um, so let's say it's a living rock creature of some kind. We're not going to throw the like, Durin's Bane um, at everyone right away. Actually, let's do this slightly better. Let's say instead of just a rock creature, it's a magma creature. Um, make it a bit more dangerous, throw some fire in there. Um, so this could be depending on uh, the, what beastry you're going from. And let's say it's an elemental of some kind. Um, that gives it, so it's a purely magical creature, then an, ele an elemental, right? It's living magic, basically, from a plane. Um, uh, well, yes, I would like more to drink. Thank you. Um, sorry, I need more tea. Um, so we're going to have the mine. Uh, the miners set loose a rock elemental. Several, um, let's see here. Lava bending is advanced earth bending after all. Yes, lost luck, it is indeed. I also watch Legend of Korra. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so we have the hook that the miners set loose subterranean beast. Um, let's say a dozen miners died. Oh, we should figure out what kind of mine this is. Um, Uh, uh, what kind of mine is this, guys? Um, is it going to be like a coal mine, um, where you kind of have to risk about risk, you know, uh, big fires and things like that that can uh, wipe out an entire town? Uh, is this like are they mining mithril? Are these guys, you know, f fabulously rich because they have gold and mithril at, at hand? Um, do they mine diamonds or gemstones? Uh, um, let's have some suggestions here. Uh, gemstones are often magical in nature. I see uh, Harley saying, what if the ore became magical and turned into the elemental? A red potato bide. Yes, the mines of red potato. That's right. Uh, so many options. Iron, copper, gold. So, so let's, let's start. Um, let, let's make this simpler. You're right. There's too many options right now. Uh, let's talk about uh, base metal or gems. Let's talk, let's talk about that. Uh, let's say it's not going to be a gold mine. Let's say they're, they're too poor for gold. Um, tin. Lost Lux says tin. All right. A hum, a hum, the humble existence of a tin miner. Uh, all right. Any other suggestions? I'll give a chat a minute to catch up. All right, so it sounds like we're going with base metal. All right. It seems, it seems like it seems like lost luck wins with tin. Um, I am going to attempt switching which screen. Th what's on my screen? So just a second here. No, nope, that didn't work. Uh, just a second. I need to hold on. I want to get Firefox on here, but I have to do something with my streaming software. Uh, just a second. Slightly drawback of using open free open source uh, streaming software is that sometimes. So I'm going to check Wikipedia for uh, ores that contain tin. Um, to add a bit of re add a bit of realism to uh, our mind here when we describe what when we describe to people what this is, uh, it doesn't hurt to look up some things like well you know, gemology and things like that. So, so we, so we are a cassiterite mine. 
So that is what red potato is. It, red potato is a cassiterite mine. All right. So tin, um, yeah, tin, uh, Viking makes an excellent point. Uh, tin is a vital ingredient in producing bronze. Uh, yay, this is like Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, a little bit. And I mean, that's cool too. Uh, Dwarf Fortress is a fantastic game that I've never had the patience for, but uh, yeah, it's like Dwarf Fortress. Um, they dug too, they're mining tin and they dug too deep. They're mining cassiterite and they dug too deep. Um, so tin uh, was, I, I seem to recall reading that tin was like incredibly valuable during the, well, it was running out of tin is what caused the Bronze Age to end and people having to start develop uh, iron weaponry and things like that instead because uh, tin used to be abundant near the surface in the Fertile Crescent and it was all mined out. At least that's a theory that I've heard before. Um, and as a result, it got too hard to produce bronze. So we have our tin mine. We have our, our so, so they're mining away. Question, will there be other races, uh, says Harley Silverwolf. And I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to try and twist them away from their stereotypes. Uh, so for instance, I will likely not have elves living in trees or dwarves living in halls in the mountain. Um, that's not to say that not that's not to say that all of them will be different, um, but I'm going to try and avoid using standard uh, fantasy setting tropes, if only just to make the world feel different and varied. Um, one thing I've done in my own setting before also is uh, have uh, racial varieties, and I think this is something Fifth Edition actually adds. I only got the player's handbook for Fifth Edition today, but. Um, uh, fifth edition D and D adds variety. We haven't even decided, as Lost Luck points out, what race is actually doing the mining right now. Um, and that's a good point that uh, we don't really need to decide absolutely until we know what race our players are playing. Um, we're probably going to choose just because I don't expect I'll be getting to actually playing this before the next few sessions, and it's going to become really irritating if we don't know who these people are. Uh, but we can get to that in a little bit or uh, in the next session. <laughs> yeah, let's not try to clatter up too much in metallurgy, but one of the fun things about making worlds, or at least things I find fun about making new worlds, is actually learning these new things about how stuff goes. Like uh, for my previous world, I studied, I did a bit of studying of tectonics um, so that I could put mountains where they belong, or rather, I started doing it one way and then I'm like, screw it, I need a mountain here. Uh, and so then we went the other way and made the tectonics match what the mountains were. So we have a dozen, we have a dozen dead miners and a living rock creature. And as a result, um, so the, the, Monster makes it impossible to access the ore vein because it's too dangerous. There's this big burning thing down there. So the town is slowly starving. Um, enter the heroes, really. This is, um, so an adventuring party is going to come to town, obviously. They're going to be our players. Uh, the players probably aren't going to be from here. Uh, they're probably going to be different races. Um, and they're probably each going to want to have their own backstory other than they are a miner or miner's kid or something like that who chose to step up to the challenge, right? Uh, it's very... So when starting a new campaign, it's possible to give your players some requirements for what their backstory has to be. Um, in the past, I've had great luck with saying, you were all drafted. I don't care who you were beforehand. You're soldiers now. Um, that's one way to kind of thrust the uh, setting upon them. But that... People don't always go for that. that. Sometimes that rubs people the wrong way. Um, so we can expect that players coming into this aren't going to be from here. There's always someone who wants to be the descendant of a god. Yes, uh, very often true, Viking. Or they want to be from the Outer Plains. Um, or they want to be Drizzt or whatever. Um, so the heroes presumably arrive... Uh, 
Let's see. What's a good play? What's a good way to drop the heroes in? They, maybe the heroes just all arrive from their own origins. Um, how did they get here? I'm going to say the train tracks aren't a dead end. They pass through. So now we have a world in two directions uh, where the players can, could have come from. Um, let's say, let's go further. Someone mentioned an avalanche shutting off the train track. That's actually something we can use here to make the players get off, the, to give their players a reason to be off, not on the train. So. All you have to do is say there's a place called Red Potato and they will want to go there. So uh, Harley, I want to start them. I'm actually going to start this with them in um, in Red Potato. Um, probably just having just walked into town. Uh, we, like I said, they can have their own. So um, if you have players who want to kind of tell their own story alongside yours, it's important to kind of have them open to do that. So. Basically, we're going to come in here with the character, the player characters are all kind of just somewhere in their own story, maybe halfway through or at the beginning of their own story. Um, and they get, in this case, literally derailed um, and have to, and they're doing this adventure now. Um, if we're starting at level one, maybe they're just traveling to meet people or um, going to school or just wanting to see the world, you know, maybe there's a Maybe there's a place in the wider world that's of interest to them, um, and they just got stuck here instead. And this is where the Call to Adventure is going to find them. Uh, so all the passengers are stuck in the town um, because of this avalanche. Um, uh, and as a result, so now... Uh, And that's really how we deliver our first hook. So at the start of the session, you sit down, you say, you've all been, so I would say something like, you're all taking the train from kingdom to the north to kingdom to the south, passing through the mountains. Uh, unfortunately, just outside of a small mining village, you, a avalanche uh, hits the train, causing it to derail. You are now stranded uh, in the town of Red Potato. Um, Stepping into town, you see it is a shabby-looking uh, mining village, um, roofs sagging under the weight of winter snowfall, um, star hungry-looking people pacing warily through the streets, going about their business, some stopping to look at you and the other passengers as you disembark the train uh, and walk into town. This is starting to sound a bit like District 12. Um, but uh, someone... Um, assuming your characters are of good alignment, will likely want to find out what's happening in this town. Why are the people starving and looking at you so warily? Um, if you've got more of a chaotic type player group, maybe they go to the bar and there's like no beer because they the town is so poor that they can't get beer anymore, um, which would be a goddamn tragedy uh, that the players must set right. Um, so maybe the mine's been closed for a few weeks now while they, you know, try and get help from wherever. Uh, let's actually make a note of that. Um, so mine's been closed for weeks. Um, Presumably this town has um, someone they supply with their ore to who might be, who would be keen to help them out, but maybe help hasn't come. Maybe, you know, it's the wrong time of year or something terrible like that. Um, 
so now we've got these player characters in their gear, and maybe they're level 1, maybe they're level 16. We haven't really decided yet. Harley Silverworth makes a good question. How would the town even serve them food if they themselves are starving? Maybe that's it. Maybe they get, maybe the players get to the inn and are turned back because there's no food for them. Um, there's no, they, they can't stay there because there's no food, there's no beer, nothing. Um, so it's a town on incredibly hard straits, and now they're looking... Actually, that's a good one, because the villagers would look at the uh, train passengers now with some hostility, you know, more mouths to take from their table. Um, in any case, it be, in any case, we now have it in the player character's best interest to go into the mine and be heroes. And this is, you know, how you deliver a good hook. All right? They don't really have... They, they can't just go running off if you've got the kinds of characters who want to just disappear. Um, the townsfolk are suspicious of them, so they're not going to be able to go around stealing everything. Um, and they've got this one really obvious way that they can, you know, help the townsfolk and endear themselves. And so that kind of gives us our first adventure right there. Um, you have your mines below town, um, and your, you know what your end boss in that mine is going to be. Uh, which is to say this magma creature of some kind. Um, for uh, lesser foes, perhaps, uh, let's talk about this, actually. So we've got... We've got our magma creature boss, but uh, we probably aren't going to do a single, a single combat encounter um, in this whole thing, so... Lesser dangers... Well, it's a mine, which means we have the chance of cave-ins. Or um, maybe the magma creature leaves behind patches of lava. Patches of animate lava, magma. It's magma when it's below ground, I think. Um, so there's our, there's our, we have some environmental dangers just because it's a, uh, that's the other thing. Player characters are usually pretty good about not getting lost. Uh, if they've got a ranger or a druid or someone who can figure out what direction north is regardless, um, uh, that's one thing. Or they can do the follow the right wall trick to get their way through, something like that. Um, uh, this is actually a point. Mazes aren't much fun. Uh, unless you're especially into that. Um, so we don't want getting lost to be too bad. But yeah, you can come across, you know, here's a big open pit of lava. How are you going to get across it, right? Well, we can make a bridge. We'll make a bridge with what? Um, and figure that part out. Uh, depends on the player character's abilities. Um, actually, this is a good note for anyone who's a starting DM. Uh, give your players this bit of description first. So say, you know, we've got this kind of technology level. Um, you're going to be... You're, you have some reason to be on a train going to the other kingdom, which we'll get to when we talk about the region. Uh, why are you here and get their character sheets first um, something I always require is that players give me their character sheet uh, before the first session not so much so that I can check that their characters are okay or I'm not giving them permission to play the character they want to play that's silly uh, but rather just so that I know what they're capable of so that I can set up an appropriate challenge um, at low levels especially players don't have a lot of options open to them so they might not be able to get across a giant pit of magma underground. Uh, it would be an interesting challenge to see if they're creative enough to do so, but I don't want it to be impossible. Um, and so it helps to know uh, what your characters are playing and what abilities they have, even things like what's in their spell list, uh, if you have magic users. Which, since this is a, a high magic, um, medium technology setting, uh, we are totally going to have magic users be part of the party, and they're nothing special right at the start, at least. Um, so I have five minutes left on my clock uh, for tonight's session. 
Um, it, are there any DMs in the channel who want to uh, ask a question about world building or have a situation they want to talk about uh, in the last five minutes of the stream? Okay, um, so I will stay online until 10 o'clock, um, but uh, this is going to be the end of tonight's show. Um, next time, I will fix my drawing situation so that we can actually start making a map, both of the region around uh, where this, where, uh, region around Red Potato, um, so this mountainous area that, that it's in with the trains uh, and two nearby settlements, and two uh, neighboring kingdoms or settlements uh, that give the train a route to go between. Um, as well, we'll, might, uh, we'll actually probably draw a map of this adventure site. Okay, question from Viking. How far ahead do you plan and with how much detail? Uh, so Viking, generally, so generally speaking, um, it depends on what's going to be going on in the session. Uh, it, assuming you're doing an adventure location, like we're talking about here, where you have a physical place where the action is taking place, um, and then a kind of other area that's town. Um, for town, you only really need a few bullet points, things like um, how big the town is roughly, um, how much the ta how much free uh, cash flow the town has, because uh, if your players want to buy or sell stuff, there's every, every system has some rules that are actually really helpful guidelines, not strict rules, but good guidelines. Uh, on how much a town can afford to buy from the party if they want to sell their crap uh, and how and what kind of things the town can sell to the party. Um, but the town itself just has to be bullet points about how big it is. Maybe um, name one or two important people. We didn't get to uh, your first NPC ally this session, but I'll cover that in the next session as well. Um, you'll want to have maybe one or two names that you can just throw out. So like the mayor of town is Steve such and such. Um, just, just throw it out. You don't, it doesn't matter if you never meet him, if he's never part of the game. Just have a name for him so that you can kind of throw it out because it makes, helps make the town feel a bit more real. Um, for the adventure site, for the, for the mines below town and stuff, you want a map and you want a few... No, uh, you want on that map to note roughly where the encounters are taking place. So where is there going to be a physical hazard or trap or monster encounter? Um... Okay. It's important to have kind of arenas planned out for monster encounters, um, especially since we're in a setting where firearms are available. So cover um, become can become very important to not avoid getting shot. Um, not so much in this case because we have a lava monster and the party might have guns. Um, so we'll see. Well, we'll work out how that's going to fit together when we actually get to drawing this map. But uh, have a physical map and note where the encounters are taking place. Um, uh, it's kind of over guess roughly um, if you're going to give multiple paths through the place which is not a bad idea um, kind of make sure that each path will give you roughly the same uh, number of encounters and amount of experience um, and then just drop parts that aren't in the parts the players explore that's fine uh, it can be a bit tricky to balance and don't try and work too hard at it generally my guideline for writing stuff is write less uh, in less detail, but more breadth. Um, have some bullet points about what the environment is like. Have maybe a couple planned out encounters, but don't necessarily know precisely where they're going to be, where these monsters are. Um, and that way you can adjust better to the player's reactions to things. So if people go one way and they miss your big, uh, they miss a big part of the dungeon for some reason, um, or they obsess about some small corner that you didn't even think much about, you can move things around, right? Don't be rigid. Have, ha have a good set of ideas, and then don't be rigid about it. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of back and forth here, but I would say know what's in the place, but not necessarily precisely how it's arranged. 
That's what I'm going to say. Know what you have, but not necessarily how it's arranged. And have a map of the location. Okay, this brings us to 10 o'clock. Any other questions? All right, please um, follow so that you'll know when I go back online. Um, you can also subscribe to my Twitter if you want to. Um, and uh, tell your friends, because I'm hoping this will be a good weekly thing. Uh, it's going to take us quite a while to get through making this setting. Um, and this is all going to be Creative Commons, so if anyone wants to use Red Potato and its surrounding area and the stuff we develop, you can go right ahead and go with it. Just I'd like you to say that you found it on Too Many Knives' Twitch channel. Um, thank you, guys. Have a good night.